Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hatfield Congregational Church. Uh, this is the Feast of Pentecost, the uh, birthday of the Christian Church. And we will begin with announcements. First of all, the uh, floral arrangement here in the sanctuary. Uh, the communion table is offered by Kristen and Casey Reno. It is in memory of all of Casey's birthday, right there, which will be this coming Friday. So happy birthday. Also offered in memory of Marie Reno. Um, that would be your mother-in-law, and you told me that is going to be on Tuesday. So Tuesday for her, and also in loving memory of Anna Antonellis, which would be, I believe, your mother. Okay, so we got all that in the flower arrangement. If anyone would like to offer a floral arrangement to be placed in our sanctuary, or to sign up for one of our Sunday morning chat and coffees, or to let us know your favorite Sunday hymns, all of those sign-up sheets, as you probably know by now, are located over there to the side. If anyone would like to purchase gift cards for Stop and Shop or Big Y, Linda is right there, and that earns 5% for the church. Mary McCarthy, right next to her, is accepting donations to the Relay for Life for Hampshire County. That will take place on June 15th and 16th. And also, one of our choir members, Jeff Holtz, right over here, is also a member of the New Valley Singers, and they are in concert this afternoon at 3 p.m. at the East Hampton Congregational Church, and they will be singing music from the Mississippi Delta. Um, if you haven't yet got your tickets, the tickets at the door are $7, and like I said, 3 o'clock this afternoon. The deacons of the church will meet tomorrow evening at 5 p.m., and next Sunday, uh, the town of Hatfield will commemorate Memorial Day with a parade and a gathering right down this road at the elementary school due to the ongoing construction at the Smith Academy Park, which is adjacent to Town Hall. The parade begins at 12.30 p.m. at the American Legion, and the program at the elementary school, um, weather permitting, is at 1 o'clock outdoors, indoors if the weather doesn't permit. And the guest speaker will be Captain Brian Berlinger, who is from the United States Marine Corps. And anyone who would like to remain after next Sunday's service, we're all invited to enjoy chat and coffee again, weather permitting, right out here on our lawn, and to watch the parade go by, and then just head down the road uh, for the town commemoration. Also, uh, she's not with us today, but Janice Perkins, um, as you probably remember, um, is accepting um, any kind of donation she'd like to make. Um, Dan Jordan is, uh, is going through an awful lot of health problems down in Florida. Uh, his health insurance does not cover his monthly, monthly medical bills, about $10,000 a month. And he does have photo art for sale, and uh, that is at fineartofamerica.com. And I can give you that email address after uh, service this morning if you're at all interested, fineartofamerica.com. And I want to mention a special thank you to uh, Linda right there because uh, Linda was there for the whole bake sale at the uh, town election. I showed up for a few hours. Um, that woman knows every single person in Hatfield. <laughs> and many times anybody came, uh, she would give them a hug, a shake, whatever, and then she would say very nicely, and this stranger who you do not know is our new pastor at the Hatfield Congregational Church, Reverend Randy, so I really appreciate that. And, uh, you should have been on the ballot. You, you know everything. <laughs> Are there any other announcements from the congregation? For several, um, June 10th is our all-church picnic. Um, it
Vineyard to hold a fundraiser for um, the Alzheimer's Association. Um, it is on the longest day. This is a, a, a association-wide uh, event, um, and it's going to be a wine tasting, and there is going to be a jazz band playing. Um, this uh, cause is very near to my heart, as my mother passed with this disease. My father remarried, and his second wife is suffering from Alzheimer's. And we also have a close friend who is diagnosed at 53 with Alzheimer's. So if you would like to come out and have a fun evening um, of wine tasting and um, music and just fellowship, you can bring a picnic basket. There's also going to be raffles there. Um, Black Birch is a very lovely new business in town um, located on Straits Road literally in my backyard. I call it my backyard vineyard. Um, um, if you are not up to uh, wine tasting and music, then you can always give me a donation uh, check made out to the Alzheimer's Association. Thank you. There's also a poster up, poster up out in the foyer. Any other announcements? Yes. I just wanted to say that our ladies night out, plus one, <laughs> uh, was really a lot of fun and thanks for everybody that came out. We went to Gianni Figs up in South Fairfield and the food is awesome. It was Really great, so thank you for everybody for turning out with that. Anything else? Okay, if there aren't any others, then the prelude for this morning's worship is in um, it's invocation, and I hope I'm saying this right Ignaz Playa. So. Oh, you think so? All right, he doesn't know we're all set. Ignaz Playa for the invocation.
Thank you. Since it is Pentecost, our greeting is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all today. Uh, Pentecost, as I mentioned, is the birthday of the Christian church. This is the day that uh, humanity started carrying forward the work that Jesus had begun. After he ascended, he promised that I will send the Holy Spirit in ten days. That is today. And so today is our birthday. Today is the day of our empowerment. Today is the day of our responsibility. Today, we are church. Uh, Pentecost, on a more lighthearted note, is also a time of breaking down barriers. And as Carol mentioned, in that spirit of breaking down barriers, I marched right into the women's uh, dinner on Wednesday evening. Uh, we've mentioned a few times that it's the women. They always say, you know, you're all invited, but then they end up by saying the women are all invited. So it was right up in South Deerfield, so I decided after my Heads Up meeting here in Hatfield that I would show up, and they were very gracious. And uh, the waitress came over, so would you like to have anything to eat? And I said, yeah, I'd like to have a bowl of your soup. And then I pointed to my wife and I said, and she's paying. And uh, the waitress didn't know who she was. She thought I just picked somebody out of the group. Uh, but Sharon uh, bought my dinner that night with the ladies. And I'll tell you, if, the, if some of you ladies don't go on this mystery ride at dinner, you should. They were having a ball. And uh, that was even with a member of the clergy sitting at the table. So before I got there, I could only imagine how much fun they were having. <laughs> so that was very nice. And if we can now, if you would turn to your bulletin uh, for our call to worship on uh, this Feast of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost has come. We are called together in Jesus' name like the men and women of ancient Jerusalem. When the Spirit descended, the timid became fearless and rushed out into the world, and the work of the church began. fire of Pentecost spirit transforms us. Surely God is in this place. Let us share this news with an excited conviction. Praise be to God. Amen. May we now recite together our unison prayer. Amazing God, your presence draws out our hidden gifts. We become more than we could ever have hope on our own. Your gift of the Spirit inspires us to see not only what is, but what should be. Where the Spirit of God is, there is the Church. You draw us out beyond the limits we suppose and give us the courage to be Church that you would have us be. Help us to dream dreams and see visions of your intention for your Church and for this world. Come among us now to make your ways known to us and empower us to make them real. Amen. May we all now join together in our opening hymn from Blue Hymnal number 263. Surely the presence of the Lord is here.
this place, and surely the presence of the Lord is in each and every one of us. And in that spirit, may we exchange the gift of peace.
That's what happened on Pentecost. These guys who were terrified of going out into the streets of Jerusalem, they were terrified what was going to happen to them. As soon as that Holy Spirit comes down, they are surprised like bang! And they head out into the streets and they start preaching about Jesus. You know what I just thought of? I got this little microphone here. I wonder what that does to the, to the camera when I go that loud. I better not do that. I might break something. So anyway, they, the Spirit comes down, and these guys, they go out into the street, and they start talking about Jesus, and all of a sudden, hundreds of people start believing in Jesus, and then they start going from there, and other people start talking about Jesus, and this person starts talking about Jesus, and they start talking about Jesus. And do you know that halfway around the world from Jerusalem, is a little town called Hatfield, Massachusetts. Oh no, did I scare you? Is he okay? I'm sorry. No more bags, I promise. No more bags. No more bags. So halfway around the world, from Jerusalem, 2,000 years later, we're sitting here in church worshiping because of you. Do you want, you want to go see mom? No. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No more bags. I'm so sorry. That... Oh, that doesn't go over well for a children's sermon. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, halfway around the world, we're here now because a few people got out of the locked room and they started talking about Jesus. That message went from mouth to mouth, person to person, all the way to here. And it can't stop here because our job is to keep doing the exact same thing. To keep talking about Jesus, to keep going out into the streets and surprising people with that message that Jesus is here, the Holy Spirit is here, that God is here, and that he comes to each and every one of us. And that's going to be a surprise to a lot of people, and we get to be able to be the ones to surprise them. Okay? So enjoy your Pentecost. Let's pray. Enjoy your Pentecost, too. Okay? <laughs> All right, guys. Go to Sunday school.
our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. And I do think that we have to begin uh, with prayers uh, for the 10 who were killed and the 10 who were wounded in Friday's school shooting down in Santa Fe, Texas at the high school. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if this is accurate or not, but there was, I believe, uh, a headline in one of the New York City newspapers uh, yesterday that said that there have now been more people murdered in high school shootings and school shootings uh, this year to date than there have been people who have been killed who are now serving in active duty military this year. Um, so there's something definitely going on that needs to be addressed. Um, our prayers for the 10 killed, the 10 wounded, um, and also for our nation that somehow uh, we be brave enough and committed enough and, and cordial enough to each other to have a serious discussion about what needs to be done because it cannot stay the way that it is. Also, we have prayers for Carolyn Newton, uh, the mother of a friend uh, from here in Hatfield. Um, and her son is the one who's here in Hatfield. He went out to Houston. Uh, he did, was able to see his mother before she passed and, and is now back home and they may be going back out for a funeral. Uh, she was 82 years old. Also, prayers for two dear ladies, uh, one of whom is here with us today, who are struggling both with cancer and its treatments that all may continue to go well for the both of them. And also, I'm very happy to announce that Marsha Sheehan is with us this morning. Um, and, and that is bittersweet uh, because when she left, everything was fine. Um, when she got down there, Jean got diagnosed with, uh, with cancer. He's been undergoing treatments down there. Those will continue. And I think you're going to Boston, you mentioned, uh, later this week. And so we have been praying for Jean right along. We'll continue to do so both for him and for you. And we pray that all goes well with those treatments. Also, an old colleague of mine has been ha hospitalized in Westfield with a severe infection. I think it's called MRSA. Um, so I do offer prayers for him that he may have a full recovery as well. Are there any other joys or concerns or celebrations that any of you would like to offer publicly from the congregation? Prayers for my cousin Donna Talega, who I visited last night, and it's something I never heard about. She's blind, she's alert, and I can't imagine Today, as mentioned, is the Feast of Pentecost in the Church. On this day, we remember that just as Jesus had promised, the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles and those who were open to the Spirit. The presence of God's Spirit was so strong that it felt like a mighty wind and also as flames as a fire. It was overpowering. It changed people. It changed the entire world. And we are evidence of that halfway around the world from Jerusalem 2,000 years later. From the smallest beginnings, the Pentecost Church has surged everywhere in our world, including right here, right now. In the assurance of God's abiding and powerful presence, we have shared our prayers publicly and privately, and because the Spirit is now here amongst us, because we know that because of Pentecost, we can be sure that all of our prayers have been heard by God. Please join me now in reciting the prayer that Jesus himself taught his church the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today is the birthday of the Christian Church. On that first Pentecost, Jesus' followers began to carry forward the ministry and the message that Jesus himself had first proclaimed. They did so through the powerful inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But it was now through human hands, through human words, that the reign of God would advance through all the world. From that moment forward, the church has served as Christ's presence in the world. This is why Pentecost is called the birthday of the church. In honor of this most sacred event, let us give what we can as our gift to Christ and church, so that what began on Pentecost some 2,000 years ago may continue through our efforts on this Pentecost Sunday here today.
Street today for our first reading. And I'll turn it over to Joseph Vincent. <laughs> you scared me too. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Special treat for me today to read the 46th Psalm. A little background on the Psalms. There's a mystery in this one. That's why I read it. The mystery involves my life in the theater. Um, but the Psalms, if you haven't researched, and I've done a little bit, there's 150 of them. They think that uh, Moses wrote the Bible, but that King David may have written the Psalms. I think a lot of people probably were involved writing the Psalms. Um, in Greek, they mean instrumental music, songs, literally. And I'm sure they've been set to music. I haven't heard them. Maybe you have. Yeah. Um, many people probably have. But the, um, the psalms that uh, I'm going to be reading from today are from the King James Bible. Now, King James came into power when Queen Elizabeth I died, about 1602 or so. And uh, he ordered that the Bible of which there were many versions, some several hundred, since the uh, Bible was instigated and then the New Testament came in. He said, we're going to have one that covers everything and it'll be the standard edition. Now it's known as the King James Version. But he asked for many people to gather, some 47 scholars, most of whom were uh, in the clergy. Uh, scholars of poetry and history and writing, and they put the Psalms uh, and the whole Bible together. That's what we know as the King James Version. Um, this poem, I'll reveal the mystery in a little while, but the Psalm itself is pretty powerful. It reads like this God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Pretty powerful stuff, as all of the Psalms are. Uh, the people who put it together uh, were working from the Greek, uh, some Latin, um, earlier versions, even the original Aramaic in the New Testament. Um, but they required scholars, and I believe they required poets. Um, I will share with you my favorite poet, uh, favorite poem ever by my favorite poet. Those of you know, I've been doing Shakespeare for about 47 years now. Um, I share this with you. It's a dedication. I've, I've spoken it at weddings, including my own. Uh, it is, uh, like the Psalms, a dedication of love. And Shakespeare had a way with uh, poetry, as you know, 38 plays and 150 sonnets. This is one of the sonnets. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, 
It is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, although his height be taken. Love is not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not within his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. I bring Shakespeare into this because the mystery in the 46th Psalm is amazing. When, the, uh, when they started writing the New Bible, the King James Version, it was 1604. They finished in about 1611. That's when they were published. They might have finished a little earlier. But Shakespeare, who was born in 1564, was 46 years old when they were published as they were being finished. And in the 46th Psalm, because he was 46, if you count 46 words from the beginning to the 46th word, it is shake. And if you count back from the last word, 46 words, it is spear. And scholars will refute this, some don't at all. They say, well, of course, Shakespeare wrote that. He's the one who helped translate it. Uh, and I like to think that as well. It's a, it's a mystery that's in there. I don't know of any other mysteries in the Psalms, but um, I love that and have, I have read it before for groups. Uh, and I'm glad to share it today. Thank you, uh, Randy, for being gracious. Thank you, Joseph. Kind of cool, there's a big shot wedding taking place yesterday over in England somewhere. <laughs> and an American preacher went over there to talk about love, and I guess it kind of uh, startled a lot of them who were a little bit more staid in, in the uh, kingly court chapel over there. Uh, so we sent an American to talk about love in England, and now we got Shakespeare coming here to Hathaway to talk about love. So thank you very much. I don't have any mysteries and I don't have any Shakespearean voice, but here is the gospel according to St. John. Jesus said, I did not speak of this with you from the beginning because I was with you. Now that I return to him who sent me, not one of you asked me, where are you going? Because I have had, I have, because I have had all of this to say to you, you are overcome with grief now. Yet I tell you the sober truth, it is much better for you that I go. If I fail to go, the paraclete, the spirit, will never come to you. Whereas if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin, about justice, about condemnation, about sin and the fact that they refuse to believe in me, about justice and the fact that I go to the Father and you can see me no more, about condemnation, for the prince of this world has been condemned. I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. When he, the Spirit, comes, however, being the Spirit of all truth, he will guide you to that truth. He will not speak on his own, but will speak only what he hears, and will announce to you the things that are to come. In doing this, he will give glory to me, because he will have received from me what he will announce to you. All that the Father has belongs to me. This is why I said, he will announce to you only what he hears from me. Hey, Joseph, did you stole my sermon, Joseph? <laughs> when you took your sheet, you took my sermon. <laughs> what? I'm not really giving it. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, just because you can do all this by memory doesn't mean I can. <laughs> well, talk about mystery. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and our redeemer. When I was a kid, a long, long time ago, uh, New Year's Eve, you know, the, the parents went out, and we were at home, and we used to watch on television, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. And that's a 1963 movie. It was on television New Year's Eve. It was a comedy about racing across the country to retrieve $350,000 in stolen cash. And a bunch of misfits were all racing across the country to see if they could get there first and grab that cash. 
And the first thing that there was this one guy, he's an Italian race car driver, the first thing he does is he gets into his car, race across the country, and he rips out the rear view mirror. And he basically says something along the lines of, what's behind me is not important. And so I definitely wouldn't take that too far when it comes to the idea of Pentecost, but it does point us in the right direction. Pentecost points the church forward. I kind of get the feeling that too often the church is always looking in the rearview mirror. We always look for legitimacy in what we did in the past. But I think Pentecost is a completely different message. Pentecost points us forward. In the recently deceased UCC theologian, he wrote, Our eye, as a denomination, is fixed on the horizon, what's ahead of us, not on our heritage, what is behind us. Now this is a theologian, he's a scholar, he's a teacher, so he's extremely well versed in Bible history, he's extremely well versed in church history, American history. He knows his past, he knows it real well, but his focus is on where we are going. And that's what Pentecost is all about. Where is the church supposed to go? We know what generations behind us did. We know that they did their job because we're here. But what are we sitting here in the year 2018 in Hatfield? Where are we going? Are we just supposed to remember what they did, or are we supposed to do something to carry the church forward? Pentecost says we have to carry the church forward. Pentecost was not a one-time event that happened in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. It is something radically different than that. Pentecost is the Spirit constantly pulling us forward. And again, I kind of get tired of the church always looking back because the message is Pentecost spirit pulling us forward. Pentecost is not expressed in terms of what was. Pentecost is the powerful notion of what we are to become. And I find that exciting. Any historian can read books and tell you about the past, but when you're talking about what we will become, that is God's living presence in us and among us. And that to me is exciting. I'm repeatedly amazed by the Bible story of Pentecost. From its very first moment, it surprised believers. Pentecost is the message, well, actually the reality, because it wasn't just words, it was a, it was a force that changed people. And, and the, the believers in the church back then 2,000 years ago, in Pentecost told them, you better not think that you can confine and define God. Because God is bigger than any of us. God is even bigger than the church. So our expectations of God don't necessarily mean they're God's expectations of God. And so those few who were locked away in fear and confusion in the upper room in Jerusalem, they had no idea what Pentecost had in store for them. They're huddled in fear. They're terrified. Like I told the kids, and especially one poor kid, they're terrified. Are they going to do this to me if I go out and talk about Jesus? And so they're huddled in that room behind locked doors, and they know that Jesus resurrected. They watch Jesus ascend into the heavens, but they don't have the gumption to go out and do anything about it. And so then all of a sudden, the Spirit comes down upon them, and now that the kids are gone, I can tell you, it was bad. They changed immediately. Nothing stayed the same. This is something that they could not even have imagined or dreamed of before that Holy Spirit was, was given to them. They would never have thought of going out into the streets and talking about Jesus. And yet as soon as that Spirit came, everything about them and everything about the world changed. One of the most important surprises, I think, in the whole Pentecost story is that the Spirit was not shared only with people who believed in Jesus. According to Acts chapter 2, and you can go home and read this for yourself, and really, it's not just me, just go home and read Acts chapter 2 for yourself. People on the streets of Jerusalem, they said that the apostles were drunk because they're just blathering on in unintelligible words. They said, you know, you guys, it's, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning and you're drunk. But this means that the apostles were saying words that really weren't words. It wasn't a matter of foreign languages, they were saying things that were not words. But that same group of people who only heard drunken blather, there were others on the streets of Jerusalem who had no idea who Jesus was, who were in Jerusalem, not because of Pentecost for Christians, but because of Pentecost for Jews. And they heard those same people that others heard only as drunken blather. They heard them talking about Christ for the very first time. Paul, who was, who was rushing back to Jerusalem because Pentecost meant so much to him, Paul writes about this mystery in his epistles, and he's, he calls it a gift of tongues. He calls it a gift of interpretation, that it comes from the Spirit. He even says this is proof that the Spirit is there, and that it's proof that God, in his expectations, is a lot bigger than ours. 
those guys huddled in that little room up in the upper room behind the locked doors, maybe they thought, this is all that you know, Christianity is ever going to be. It's just us. Maybe Jesus is just coming back for us. Then they go out into the streets. Maybe they thought, well, maybe Christianity will be whoever can believe in us who are Jews. But all of a sudden, the message goes out beyond all of those circles, all of those confines, and God reaches out to people who have no idea what Jesus is all about. This means that the spirit who is shared in the upper room with those disciples who believed in Jesus is just as powerfully shared in the streets with those who did not yet believe and maybe others who would never believe. But the spirit went out to them. That is not a message that the church is very comfortable with. We want the church to say that God is ours. But really, God is not ours. God is much bigger than ours, and we're just a part of God. And so when God reaches out into the world, our job is to follow him out into the world and to make sure that that message that God the Spirit shares, that we're there to reinforce because we don't set the confines for God, and we better not try to. You know, red is the color that is often associated with Pentecost because of those tongues of fire that descended upon those gathered in the upper room. But the Bible also uses these words to describe Pentecost. Suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. You know, wind conveys the idea we don't know where it came from, we don't know where it's going, we can't see it. And this is not just a wind, this is a violent wind. This is not a gentle breeze, this is not a fly out and fly at height. This is storm kind of wind. This is not controlled or controllable. And this is a lesson that we as believers in church, we only ignore at great cost. The Spirit is in charge. We are not in charge of God. We can imagine who's in and who's out of God's circle, but it's the Spirit who just barges through all those definitions, all of those walls, and God reaches out to people who are not even yet ready to believe. But the offer is there in God, and our job as God's church is to be there to reinforce it, and when that seed is planted, to nurture it and to bring them in. Pentecost, in other words, it's not about ratifying what is already in place, keeping the circle as it is forever. Pentecost started in a locked, small upper room, but it sure didn't stay there. You never want to use Pentecost as an argument for stasis, for keeping things always the same, because Pentecost is carrying us forward. Pentecost is the Christian tradition of change. Too many times we think about tradition as always doing the same thing. But we have a Christian tradition that in Pentecost is all about change. Paul, for example, he worked violently against the earliest church, but he was knocked right off of a donkey on his road to Damascus, ended up right on his behind on that road to Damascus, and God changed it. When the first Christians heard that Paul, this guy who was persecuting and killing Christians, that he is now a Christian, they didn't believe it. And yet there was Paul preaching the gospel. It surprised the believers, and it surprised the uh, Jesus out of Paul. The first Christians were mainly Jewish, and they figured that the, anybody else who's coming to the Christian church, that they also have to keep the Jewish tradition. And so all of a sudden, Paul is reaching out to all these people who are not Jewish and bringing them in. There's these flood of Gentiles coming to the church, and all of the first believers, they don't know what to do with it. And all of a sudden, all of these others who have come into the church, they overwhelmed the first believers, and they created the church that we have today. But those first believers were not prepared for that. But it came anyway. Pentecost is always about surprising us. You know, when believers looked back on Pentecost, they were reminded words spoken centuries earlier by a prophet by the name of Joel. They're absolutely beautiful. They're inspiring. God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Not only the ones who believe, not only the ones who come to church on Sunday, I will share my spirit with all flesh, it says. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they too shall prophesy. You know, that's, that's radical for today. But can you imagine 2,000 years ago what that must have sounded like in a world where male elders ruled everything? They ruled the house, they ruled the town, they ruled the countries, they ruled everything. Women were possessions, children were seen but not heard. Male elders ruled everything. And all of a sudden you've got this kind of a message. The spirit would not only be theirs, it would inspire their sons. That means that the, those young people, they had a voice. Not only seen, or not only seen, but not heard. Now young people had a voice. And not only your sons, your daughters too. 
We're talking about a fundamental equality here that they could not imagine 2,000 years ago, and the world still has problems with today. Your sons and your daughters, in the eyes of God, exactly the same. The Spirit comes upon both of them, and they will prophesy. The church should be at the forefront of equality in every form, not fighting against it as too often we do, because the Pentecost spirit is dragging us forward, sometimes kicking and fighting all the way, but it's about a fundamental equality. If youth and women were not enough, the spirit would also touch and inspire the slaves, the male and the female slaves, the people who are owned by other people. And so that is basically the message that this church of ours, this Christian church, is about empowering the powerless. And that means the stranger, the one who is a, is, is a foreigner, the one who is unknown, the one who is on the fringe of society, because the slaves were those people. Jews did not enslave other Jews. These were other people. And God says, I will set my spirit upon your male and your female slaves. The Spirit doesn't care about status. He doesn't care about your country. He doesn't care about your citizenship papers. The Spirit goes out in that fundamental equality. In a world becoming increasingly divided by those with wealth and power and those who don't have either, we better not forget that Pentecost message about equality. The Pentecost Spirit is not about justifying who we are and what we have. The Pentecost Spirit is about inspiring us to try to see like God sees. And that means that every single person on this earth is special to God. And that God loves some African child who is now starving as much as he loves me. And if that's true, I better try to do something to equalize the difference between us. And even when it comes to those male elders, the symbol of traditional power, they wouldn't stay the same either. They wouldn't be forgotten. Those ones in power, God didn't forget them. It says that they will dream dreams. They wouldn't only cling to power. They would dream dreams of what could be. Harriet Tubman was born a slave. She bravely escaped up north and then even more bravely went back south and led other slaves to freedom. This once enslaved woman said, every great dream begins with a dream. Pentecost makes us all dreamers, but Pentecost specifically calls out the ones in power, the ones who can make changes to dream dreams, to use their privilege to make a difference in our world. Our leaders, says Pentecost, have to be dreamers. Jesus warned, from everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. There's a moral obligation that tags along with authority, status, and wealth. And it's not only to make sure that we keep authority, status, and wealth, it's to do that equality that God loves and cares for us all. Pentecost is always calling us to become. And that is far from easy. That's not just a matter of sitting in church for an hour on Sunday and thinking, oh, I'm a great Christian. Pentecost wants us to become something more. And that's why in today's gospel, Jesus tells his followers, I still have many things to, take, to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you to all truth. We need the Spirit's help to become what Jesus wants us to be and what Jesus knows that we can be, but we can't do it on our own. So for as much as Pentecost is the Spirit leading us forward to wherever God would have us go, it's also about the Spirit right here amongst us now. You know, I'm always amazed at what God the Spirit can do. You know, there, there are things that, that take place every day in my life that I realize it's not just Randy Calvin, that there is the Spirit working, and I am so grateful to be aware of that. We just have to be in tune with that, and we'll touch upon that in a second, but the Spirit is right here, right now. And for everybody who chose on a Sunday morning, whether this church or another church, whatever, to stay home and just to do something else and to forget all about God in their lives, they're tuning that whole powerful presence of God off. And that, that, that's a shame because God is here. And, you know, when we talk about God being here and leading us, it's not like he's leading us to God and God is at some distant point far ahead of us or far up above us. God is with us for that whole journey, walking with us, just like that beautiful poem about the, the footprints in the sand. God is with us, not keeping us where we are, but leading us forward the whole way. And as Joseph Vincent read so beautifully and powerfully from Psalm 46 earlier, that is temple liturgy from the ancient Jerusalem temple. And it reassures God's people that no matter how tumultuous the world may be, everything around us can change, it says. But the refrain is, God is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, still today, 
God is pulling us forward. God is pulling us to become. But he's not so far ahead of us. He's not so far above us that we can't say that God is with us always. And that is the purpose and the message of Pentecost. The Spirit fills us and abides us right here, right now, and always. So Pentecost is a celebration that the Spirit is already on us, but we can be so much more than we already are. So I'll close with those words from Psalm 46, words that are posters and pictures. I have one in my kitchen. It's just a powerful statement, and it means so much about why we are here right now. Be still and know that I am God. We have so much that we have to do, but we can't do it with God. So every once in a while, we need to come to a place like this, a sanctuary from the world, and just be still and know that I am God. And in that spirit, may Pentecost fill each and every one of us, may it fill this congregation, and may we become what only God knows we are supposed to become. And in his name we pray, amen. In continuing in that spirit of Pentecost, uh, let us please turn now to the blue hymnal, number 241, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine. Body of Christ. 